rolling. Okay, in this video, we're going to look at an example calculating curvature. Uh, so I've got an equation up here, and so this is a pretty familiar example, except you might notice when we looked at this uh, equation, similar equation before, I had a 3 cosine t and a t and a 3 sine t, and I've replaced that j component function with a t squared here. Uh, partly so that we could look at something that has some interesting things going on with curvature in particular. So before we get into actually calculating curvature, I want to just think a little bit about what this curve should look like. We will look at it on the computer at the end of this video, but just thinking about it a little bit. So the 3 cosine t and 3 sine of t in the x and z directions uh, for our curve will generate that rotation around a cylinder of radius 3. Uh, around the y-axis. So we think about this cylinder radius 3 around the y-axis. And so our curve is going to rotate around that. And then the t squared in the y-direction, uh, you can kind of think about when t is negative and when t is positive. You'll have values that give you the same output here. So for example, when t is negative 1 and when it's positive 1, uh, you get the same value here. Uh, and then you might also think about when t is 0, what's going to happen, and then what happens when t gets larger. And so we can kind of think about that idea of that cylinder, and our curve will wrap around that cylinder, but then what's going to be a little different than some of the other ones we've looked at is that in the y direction, we're going to have increasing distance between those coils as we move on out. When t gets larger, say be bigger than pi or something like that, uh, when I increase that t by a little bit and then I square it, the square will compound how much bigger I go in the y direction. And so in some ways, if you think about the shape of a parabola, so shape of a parabola, and then think about taking that parabola and sort of wrapping it around that cylinder of radius 3 that's going around the y-axis, that sort of might help you visualize what this curve would look like. I have a wire here that I sort of bent in the shape of what our curve will look like. Um, so at t equals 0, uh, we can think about what's going to go on here, and that would be sort of like what would be happening at the bottom of the parabola or as you wrap it around the cylinder at one end. And then you can see here I've got sort of this shape where it's flatter here. And then the idea is that these coils would be spread farther apart as you go farther out. We will look at this on the computer in a little bit. But the idea here is that you're going to have this sort of crisscrossing rotations as it wraps around the cylinder. And the coils will get farther apart as you continue on out that curve. Um, so, part of the reason that's interesting is that you can think about a parabola or a parabola wrapped around a cylinder and see that there are parts of that curve that are bendier than others. And so, thinking about curvature as a descriptor of how bendy a curve is, there's some interesting stuff going on with, the, with a curve that will look like this. Okay, so if we're going to calculate curvature, uh, again, there are some shortcut formulas. You want to think about which one's most appropriate for the problem you're working on. Uh, but this formula, which I had written down in a previous video, uh, works nicely for this problem. This does require that your parameterization is smooth. Uh, so your R of t has to be a smooth parameterization of the curve. So remember that in order to calculate uh, or to determine whether you have a smooth parameterization or not, uh, you need to calculate the derivative vector, which is the v vector. So we're going to need to calculate that anyway. All right, so at this point, once you've realized what you need to calculate and you look up or remember a formula, you just let the symbols tell you what to do. So it, that's part of why it's important to pay attention to what all this notation actually means, because once you write the formula down, if you know what the symbols mean, you just follow the directions that the formula is telling you to do. Um, all right, so I need to calculate a v vector and an a vector and a cross product and a magnitude, another magnitude, cubit, and divide. All right, so that's all pretty straightforward stuff. Uh, our v vector here is our derivative, so negative 3 sine t. 2t and 3 cosine t. Uh, notice that at this point we can determine that we do have a smooth parameterization. This derivative vector is continuous for all values of t. 
and this is never the zero vector because the sine function and the cosine function are never zero at the same t value. So we do have a smooth parameterization for this problem. Uh, I've got my v vector. Eventually I'll take the magnitude of that. I'm going to go ahead and write down my a vector. So just finding our derivatives here. Okay, now I need to do the cross product. Uh, I do need to be careful here because if I mess up anything in this cross product, then it's going to be messed up in my magnitude that I need to calculate next. So in particular, when you are going to use a result to get later results, oh, don't make a mistake, I almost left off my coefficient there, and 3 cosine t and uh, negative 3 cosine t to negative 3 sine t. Okay, so when I do this cross product here, uh, we're going to have a lot of stuff. It looks pretty messy to start with, so go ahead and write this down. So I have this product minus this product and the i component. Remember in the j component, you've got that minus um, this product minus that product. So, and my minus sign got a little stuck on my 3 there, so be careful up here. This is negative. So negative 3 sine t times negative 3 sine t is 9, positive 9 sine squared t. There's a minus out front on my j component though. And then minus this product, so that'll be a minus and negative, which will be plus 9 cosine squared t. This part will simplify. I'm going to go ahead and do that. There's a Pythagorean identity right there, so that all simplifies to 9. We don't want to forget the minus sign out front. And uh, then in the k component, I'm going to have this product, so negative 6 sine t minus this product, so minus a negative plus 6t cosine t. Okay, now I need the magnitude of that vector. And uh, this is one of those places that when you first do a problem like this, it looks like a nightmare. But after you've done a problem like this, one maybe is enough, you notice that when you see another problem similar to this, uh, you notice there's going to be a lot of simplification that happens if you just kind of follow through the algebra. And that simplification can be really helpful if you want to analyze your answer, not just calculate an answer, but analyze the answer. Okay, here, so I'm going to have the magnitude of this vector. So I'm going to have this first component squared. Uh, so at some point I probably will FOIL that all out. And then plus this j component squared, so negative 9 squared will just be 81 plus, and then this expression squared. And all of that's inside my radical. Okay, so when you first look at this, uh, you might be tempted to just leave it in that form and put that on the numerator of your curvature function. But in particular, if you want to analyze what's happening with curvature when t is at different values or when t gets larger or smaller, you probably want to do this simplification. And maybe already at this point, you recognize what's going to happen here. If you expand this out, you're going to get a couple Pythagorean identities, and you're also going to get some terms that have a positive and negative of the same term that cancel. So uh, let's go ahead and do that here. Uh, I'll have 36t squared sine squared of t. And then I will have a um, plus from my negative times negative, uh, 2 times 6 times 6, so 72 t cosine t sine t, cosine t sine t, and then a plus 36 cosine squared t, plus 81. Here I'll get, I'm going to go write some terms actually below this so we can kind of notice how this simplifies. So when I do this one and expand this out, I'll have a 36 sine squared of t, which is going to combine with this one and a Pythagorean identity to simplify. And then I will have a minus uh, from 6 times 6, minus 6 times 6, so minus 72t sine t cosine t. So that will cancel with this term. 
and then this term squared, so we plus 36 t squared cosine squared t. And so these two will be able to combine using Pythagorean identity and simplify that a lot. All right, so I'm going to put my result over here for my magnitude of v cross a. Um, all right, so these two terms will combine to give me a 36 t squared inside the radical. And uh, these two terms cancel. These two terms will combine to give me a 36. And then don't forget this 81 term that's here. So 36 plus 81 is 117. Even better, we might notice that there is a 9 that divides into both of those. You might not notice that 9 divides into 117, but 9 divides into 36 plus 81. So that might lead you to notice that. I'm going to simplify just even a little bit more, just so that we can analyze at the end. So if I factor a 9 out of those and then take that square root of 9, I'll have a 3 outside the radical here, and then 4t squared plus 13. Um, all right. So that's my v cross a. Magnitude of v, thankfully, will be a little simpler than that. So let's go ahead and do that here. Uh, magnitude of v, I'm going to have a 9 sine squared t plus a 9 cosine squared t. So we'll just make that a 9. And then plus my 2t squared, so plus 4t squared. Um, OK, so now I can write down my curvature uh, expression here. So magnitude of v cross a. divided by magnitude of v cubed. And so we could leave it like that. I'm going to do one more step of simplification just so we can analyze a little bit. On the denominator here, I've got the square root of something cubed. So I can rewrite that as, uh, let's see, I'm going to separate this into two separate fractions here. So on the denominator, I've got the 9 plus 4t squared uh, from the square of this. The square root of that squared is this. And then another square root of 9 plus 4t squared. Or I'm going to actually write it as 4t squared plus 9 uh, so that I can kind of think about these two. Uh, parts of this fraction here. Okay, so uh, in thinking about the geometry when I had my wire here, you should be able to think about that uh, at the what would be the vertex of the parabola as it's wrapped around that cylinder. So at t equals zero, uh, we should expect to have the most bendy part of the curve, the most bendy part of the curve. And then as we go on out, just thinking about the sides of the parabola, and even as that's wrapped around a cylinder, you should expect that those are going to be straighter and straighter as you go on out. And so you're going to have smaller and smaller curvature. Um, so let's just plug in a couple of numbers here, uh, one number actually, and then we'll go look at the computer here. All right, so when I plug in uh, t equals 0 and calculate the curvature at t equals 0, um, here I will have 3 ninths or 1 third, and then times square root of 13 over square root of 9. Uh, so my square root of 9 will cancel with my 3 here. So I'll have square root of 13 over all over 9. Uh, so if you plug that into your calculator just to get kind of a number sense here, it's about 0.4. Uh, if I plug in, say, t equals 1 and simplify that, uh, you'll get uh, square root of, oh, let's see, 3 over 13 times square root of 17 thirteenths. Uh, just plugging that in, t equals 1 here, gives you your square root of 17. Uh, that's about 0.26. So just look kind of like we described, we expect that we have a bendier curve at t equals 0. And then when t gets a little bit bigger, we've got less bend in the curve here. And then the other thing to think about, which is helpful when you've simplified it like this, is what happens as t approaches infinity? As t approaches infinity, what happens to this curvature expression as t approaches infinity? And putting it in this form maybe helps you think a little bit about that. Um, for these two terms, as t approaches infinity, uh, so the 13 and the 9 barely matter at all. Uh, so this part here approaches 1 as t approaches infinity. And then this part of the expression here, as t approaches infinity, will approach 0. So 0 times 1. Uh, we'll get that curvature approaches 0 as t approaches infinity. 
So as we go further and further out on the curve, that curvature is approaching zero. You might notice from looking at this equation that there's no value of t that you could plug in that would make this curvature exactly equal zero. No value of t is going to make this all zero out, but the curvature will approach zero as we go further and further out. All right, let's go over to the computer and look at an image of this curve. Um, I have graphed here in Calc Plot 3D. I had to be a little creative with my graphing here because this gets so extended out. Uh, so I've graphed the curve here. I've got three cosine t in the x, t squared in the y, and three sine t in the z. Uh, I've got one revolution, so zero to two pi, and uh, two orientation arrows. I probably want to change that to primary color there just so it's a little easier to look at. And I did have to play with the scale on my x, y, and z axes a little bit. So uh, I did my x going from negative four to four and my z going from negative four to four. Uh, for my y, when I think about t going zero to two pi, I had to think about how big y was going to be. Uh, so a little less than 40. When we get out there, 2 pi, the quantity squared, will be a little less than 40. And then the other thing I did here, which you may not have done before, is that I made the tick marks on my y-axis go by 5. Uh, otherwise, I end up with so many tick marks on my y-axis, you can't see anything. Uh, the other thing about this curve is that uh, because the y scale is so big, everything's sort of... Uh, hard to see here, scrunched way in on the x and z axis. So I'm just going to use the little wheel on my mouse here. And if I just roll that up, we can zoom in a little bit. Um, I can also press, I believe it is shift, and use my left arrow key. Uh, maybe shift, or maybe it's alt. Alt, there we go. Alt and left arrow key. And I can move the graph over a little bit so that it's, uh, so I can see it easier in the screen here. Um, all right, so there I can kind of see my curve a little bit. I'm going to go over here to the, I'm going to close the grid here. I'm going to go over here to the wheel so that we can check what we want to see on the curve as I trace along here. So it's, a, it's at the default settings right now. I want a trace point and a trace vector. I don't really want to see the V and the A vector. I am interested in the unit tangent vector. I want to see how that unit tangent vector changes as we move along here. And then you might also notice uh, that another choice that I can choose here is that I can see some, uh, some values for uh, curvature and torsion. Let's see, uh, curvature and torsion. Maybe I don't see that on here. Uh, tangent and secant. Okay, let's go ahead and graph this and see the curve, the, uh, the t vector changing. So here at the beginning, that t vector, notice as I move, I'm going to just increase my t from 0 to, say, 1 here. I'm just going to type that value in. t goes 0 to 1. So our t vector has changed a little bit from t equals 0 to 1. When I increase that t value a little bit more here, uh, when I go from t uh, 1 to 2, you notice that t vector has changed somewhat, but a little bit less. And then as we go farther on out here, notice here that t vector is barely changing at all. It is changing, but not much. As I move along that curve, that part of the curve is flatter and straighter. And as we continue to go on out here, that tangent vector is going to change even less and less because the curve straightens out as we keep going along that curve there. Okay, so do some more practice problems. The calculations are not hard, but they do require some practice so that you don't make mistakes at any step through there. Uh, so make sure you practice that enough so that you're not making any mistakes due to just some algebra uh, issues there. So practice that. And then the other thing on your homework, it doesn't always ask you to graph it, but it's kind of a good idea to do what I just did here and go ahead and graph it and look at those vectors and so that you can kind of think about what's happening uh, with that tangent vector and why your answers might make sense. Okay, try some practice problems.